Oh, see on time. Mm -hmm. So I see we live on Facebook. We're going. It's not quite there yet, but it's going. It's setting up. And we should be live. Yep. Hello, those in Facebook, we will be starting at three o'clock exactly. So it's interesting, I've gotten a few emails in the past week from people asking, does anybody know anything about and I was able to say, come to this training on how to better secure your meetings. <laughs> That's excellent. And it's been a topic on people's minds, I think. You know, it was really wild at the beginning of the pandemic when everyone was sort of new to Zoom. But I think it's coming back around again as something that now that it's the way we get everything done, you know, it's just a, a factor we got to deal with. Yes. So uh, are we recording this? No, we're, well, it's live on Facebook, so we're recording it there. It's on Facebook being recorded, okay. So I think you should let people in. Let people in. I'm getting ready to do it now. So that we can really begin at three. And I am going to... When we start, I'm going to mute everyone, but uh, Nick, you should be able to unmute yourself. Mm -hmm. Hello, welcome. Hey, Annette, it's good to see you. I said yes. Hi, how are yes. you? I am well. He's nice to work with in any case, but. Um, how you doing? Yeah, so, he, so he's like, oh, absolutely. Hey, Dawn. Okay, she caught it. <laughs> We'll be starting at three. We have about four minutes, but we wanted to let people in um, while we wait to get started. Hey Val, can you spotlight you and Nick? I can. Yeah, I think that would be that would be great. What do you think, Nick? Is that cool? Yep, sounds great. I think having you and Val on would be perfect. There's another little technique I learned. You can spotlight up to nine people at one time. I know. Isn't that kind of amazing? Yep. I'm starting to learn a little tricks of the trade, Nick. <laughs> nine people good. simultaneously, Barry? Yep. You can do nine. You can spotlight nine people and leave them on the screen for everybody. And, and that, that's the nine people that are being on. It's almost like doing a webinar in a sense, but it's not quite. Mm -hmm. No, but it is similar. Yep. I see Ashley Mapp is on. Hi. Hi, everybody. Hi. Hi, Ashley. Hi. Hey, Ashley. How are you? Topic. Hello. It's timely. I need to schedule an appointment with you. OK. You got my cell. I do. I will send you a message when we get off of here. Great. I don't know what I'm waiting for, Ashley. You have my cell too. <laughs> <laughs> I do. I will use it. We will be starting in two minutes at three o'clock. And we are also live on Facebook. Please, um, it probably says it on your screen, but I want to make sure to call your attention to that. Oh, Ansel. Hey, Leland, how are you? Hi, Ansel. Well, first of all, hi, everybody. And thank hi, you. everybody. Hey, Ansel. Hi. Hello, everybody. Hi, how hey, are I'm you? Nice to Annette, I see. Hey, Annette. Hey. 
Oh man, I feel like I'm back on campus for a minute. I see Leland got the nice background back there. <laughs> I see you, man. I'm looking. <laughs> yeah, man. I'm not sitting out on the street. I'm good. <laughs> <laughs> now, if you would have had a scarf on, I would have been a little concerned, but okay. <laughs> Glad you could join us. Glad you can join us. Happy to be here. I um, I, I have a hard stop at, uh, in a half hour, but I wanted to at least pop in. Well, you're going to get some information from uh, from Nick and, um, and, and Dr. Valerie, so I'm glad you can join us. Thank you so much. Thanks for having me. Oh, is that Perry? I know that's not Perry. I Yes, it is. Yeah, uh huh. How are you, man? Oh, wow. Mr. Perry, how are you? I'm here. I'm here. I see, man. I see. Look at you. And the I'm people here. are coming. And the people are coming. Amon is here. <laughs> oh, I see her. I see, Amon is here. Ashley is back with us. Right. Isabel is back with us. Hmm? Marcia. Sure. Marcia is here. Oh. Hi, Marcia. I promised that we would start on time and people have to leave um, early. I heard someone just say, so I want us to go ahead and get started. Um, Colleen, please monitor the waiting room. And uh, um, Darren and I will monitor uh, the chat here. Yep. And on Facebook, we are on Facebook Live. It should say that on your screen, but I just want to make sure to call your attention to it. So as some of you are aware, during the MLK Symposium, we had the unfortunate uh, experience of being Zoom bombed. Now, I had heard of Zoom bombs, but I had never experienced it, so did not know how disruptive it could actually be. And it was so upsetting, um, but we were very um, fortunate. We had a stage manager who was able to get control of the situation and we were able to uh, shut down the program and, um, you know, and to handle it. And then when that was over, we contacted uh, public safety because I looked on the, on Zoom's website, and they said you should notify public safety if it happens, which we did. They followed up, and they put us in touch with a with a friend who we had for a while, and that is Nick Falcone. Now, I need you all to know that this man is an expert in information security. He is the university's chief information security officer. I'm going to do what Darren told me to do. I'm going to, oh, I can't. Okay, never mind. I'll do that later. Um, but um, he came, you know, he came, he talked us through some things. He works out of the Office of Information Security. And we met him this summer when he did a program for us called Protect Your Voice. And that was a program that we were doing for community members who were, who are activists and helping them to learn ways to protect their emails, their Zooms, their communications so that their information is able to push out to um, their constituents without being intercepted, diluted or anything happening to it. And so when we thought about what can we do to improve the safety of our virtual meetings, we called on him again. So I am going to introduce him. I'm going to spotlight him and turn the program over to him and we're gonna get started. So Nick Falcone is the university's chief information security officer. And I want to highlight him. So thank you so much for that oh, uh, lovely introduction. Done, I'm not done introducing you. <laughs> oh man, I was trying to get away with this. Come on. You. <laughs> Nick Falcone is the university's chief information security officer. He spent the last decade working in information security in Philadelphia's not-for-profit sector. Prior to coming to Penn in 2018, Nick led the information security functions at Einstein Healthcare Network and Thomas Jefferson University and hospitals. Nick has also been on the information security team at the Children's Hospital of Philadelphia. Prior to moving to the not-for-profit sector, 
Nick had a career in information security consulting after getting his start as a civilian employee well, of question. the Department of Defense. I am going to mute everyone. And then Nick, please unmute yourself. And the next voice you'll hear is that of Nick Falcone. Great. Thank you again so much for the lovely introduction and, and for the opportunity to talk to folks. This is a topic that's become near and dear to all information security professionals over the last year because Zoom bombing type disruptions have become, you know, just a, a real pain for everyone who's trying to get the regular work done um, and have online conversations, online meetings, online teaching and learning. Um, you know, it's become a real uh, something we have to deal with. So I'm glad that uh, so many people came to this conversation today. We'll get you oriented on what the problem is and how we can solve it. Uh, to that end, you know, I'm going to uh, share some slides. Hopefully those will be helpful instead of uh, painful, but you never know with slides. So let me figure out how to get the, the right screen up on video here. And that way, you know, we'll uh, be able to keep moving along and keep things uh, organized and we'll get right into it. Okay. So the way I want to run through this today is just introduce the topic of Zoom bombing. And then I want to talk a little bit about what we call threat modeling. Basically, what is our adversary going to do um, so that we know how to get ahead of them and keep them from doing it? And then we'll talk about how to protect meetings. And then we'll do what I, I consider really the boring part at the end. We'll talk through how to configure Zoom specifically, right? Because a lot of some people say, well, you say to do that. How do I do it? So we'll go through some of the specifics of how. And then I have a couple slides on just other considerations around Zoom and other online meeting things that while we're on the topic are worth raising. Um, while we're going through, we have uh, team members monitoring the chat, you know, post in there, they can interrupt me and say, hey, we got a question on that topic. We'll, have, we'll make it into as much of a conversation as we can. So, and uh, as Valerie said, we're also uh, streaming live on Facebook right now. So just, you know, be aware that that's going on. This will be recorded and, and cross posted so that you can come back to it later. If you say, I kind of missed that, don't worry, you should be able to go back to the video and check it out. So when we talk about Zoom bombing, one of the things that I think is worth raising is that Zoom, you know, had this meteoric rise to high levels of use, uh, you know, about a year ago. And that was in large part because Zoom is really easy to use and it, they, part of their ease of use made it also easy to disrupt meetings. So they kind of ended up as the Kleenex or Zamboni, the brand name of Zoom bombing, right? This should really be just online meeting disruption, but they got the, the sort of stuck with the, you know, new, uh, the, the new word for this. But in part, that's because it was the biggest platform at the time, and it was the easiest platform to cause this kind of trouble on. But that doesn't mean it's the only platform where this takes place. So wherever you're doing an online meeting, where that's a, you know, a Google Meet, um, you know, a Microsoft Teams, wherever, the same kind of problems can happen. And we'll talk about principles today that can keep you ahead of those problems wherever you're doing things. Even though we'll be mostly talking about Zoom, you can keep these same ideas in mind for any platform. So threat modeling, like I said, if you know your adversary, you know how to defend against them. So we wanna talk a little bit about who we're up against and what they're doing so that we know how to stay ahead of them. And that helps us sort of say, why are we doing all these things? Ah, because it keeps them from doing X, Y, and Z. So to do that, we'll talk about how, you know, these people find different meetings, how they get into the meetings, and then how they disrupt the meetings. And then at each of those steps, we'll go through how we can stop them. So the big thing about, um, you know, nobody can bother you in a meeting if they're not in the meeting or if then if they can't get into the meeting, if they can't find the meeting. In a big way, especially at the start of the pandemic, how people were finding meetings was just publicly posted invites. If you say, you know, hey, here's a meeting we're having, here's the invite to join, somebody can find that and join it. And I think that makes intuitive sense to everyone. But then that evolved from there where people started uh, scanning the internet for links to meetings. So, you know, sometimes we feel like, oh, I posted that in my own little Facebook group that has 10 people in it. How are people gonna find that? We only have 20 Twitter followers and I want them all to come. How do they find this, um, you know, meeting link on my Twitter account? And basically if Google can find it, these people will find it. So they have all sorts of uh, automated ways of finding meeting links. So if it's on the internet, you know, in a way that somebody else can uh, see it, uh, then, you know, we have to assume that they can find it because they're, they're pretty good at finding them. And then we have uh, sort of less easy to control channels where sometimes people who are invited to a meeting share the meeting link intentionally or unintentionally to other folks who might uh, uh, join the meeting. And for groups that are sort of commonly targeted by harassment, we have to sort of think, okay, they might be really monitoring what I'm doing. So they might, you know, follow you on Twitter or follow you um, uh, somewhere else, or even, uh, you know, if you post a sign up link, which is a great way to control access to meetings, well, they might sign up and you end up having to sort of keep track of a individuals who are, uh, might be making a sustained effort at harassing you. And then how they get into the meeting once they know about it, 
um, you know, uh, Zoom originally didn't really have default passwords on meeting links, so it made it really easy. If you knew the, the sort of link for the meeting, you could get in. Now Zoom puts a password on most meetings automatically, and you know, you can change that, so that might not be the case. But that password link is, the password is stored in the link to the meeting. So um, if you have the link, you generally have the password. You can break that up, but that's not the default way Zoom works and generally not how it works. Um, you still have the invited participants might you know, forward the link uh, intentionally. And we see this maybe uh, in the higher education community kind of a lot where uh, undergrads who want um, a class to be disrupted might send the link to that class to um, a community of people who uh, disrupt things, um, you know, to specifically to cause a disruption. Um, but on the more nefarious side, even, we see uh, social engineering of invited participants. So uh, you know, we've seen people uh, pretend to be uh, at a class or an invited participant saying, oh, I misplaced the link. Can you send me that? And this often takes place in uh, informal communication channels. So like if there's a Facebook group that's sort of peripheral to uh, maybe um, a class or um, a group of students or a group of uh, community organizers, you know, it's hard to tell who people are there. People can change their name and impersonate other people. And sometimes they get pretty persistent or good at um, sort of pretending like they should have the information in order to get the information. And then last but not least, it's worth keeping in mind that people who you intentionally invited to a meeting can cause, you know, they're in the meeting and they might cause trouble. And, you know, that's uh, not to make us paranoid, but it's to sort of say like, okay, there's a limit to how much we can control. So we have to be robust in our response and ability to manage things that, you know, uh, temporarily get out of our control. And then once they're in the meeting, you know, how are these people causing these troubles? So a big one is audio. You know, if somebody can speak to an audience, they might say whatever kind of crazy thing they want to say. Um, the most dangerous to me, I think, is screen sharing. If a, a non-host can share the screen, they can share really disturbing imagery that can be harmful in, you know, just a moment. Right. So, you know, it could be you know, violent imagery, harassing imagery, um, you know, really racist imagery, you know, anything like that that can be really traumatizing to the people who view it. Um, you know, same thing can happen over file sharing, right? If somebody can share files through the, uh, the platform, even if they can't speak or share their screen or share imagery, they can post that imagery in, into the chat or otherwise move those files. People can view them and, and be, you know, really harmed. And then people also might try to share viruses and things like that when the harassment gets really, you know, sort of uh, virulent. Um, on the less harmful side, you know, people can, um, like we have the, ch the chat open today because we do want this to be a conversation, but we're also trying to be really controlled because it's kind of tempting to disrupt a meeting about how to keep people from disrupting meetings. So, but if, you know, it's harder to be extremely harmful in a brief moment over text. So that's a more safe way to allow communication. And then also sometimes you'll see participant names, right? If you, even if you shut off the chat, people change their name to some insult or some obscene thing, or they might change their video broadcast to be harmful imagery. So sometimes we, you know, might even turn off all the, um, the ability to share video. And then last, but probably also least, um, if, uh, if configured wrong, you know, Zoom will let you, I can be sharing my screen and then any participant can draw on the screen and annotate it like it's, uh, you know, uh, annotating plays in a football game, but they could draw something obscene or otherwise communicate in ways that we don't want them to. So worth keeping in mind. So that's sort of what they do. Let, let's step back for a minute, just talk about the big picture of the context that we're talking in and do a few things about setup and, and then talk about how do we control the, what, they, what these people do. So we mentioned before that we're focused on Zoom today, but it's not the only platform that, that this affects. It's just, we have to pick one. It's the most popular one. It's the most popular for, I think, uh, community organizing and other um, you know, events. And so let's talk about that, but keep in mind that it works elsewhere. And then um, to add extra confusion, Zoom has multiple products that you could be using. This is a Zoom meeting and most of our conversations take place in Zoom meetings. But Zoom also has Zoom webinars which is a great tool for when, um, if you want a really locked down meeting and you say it's really um, us broadcasting to an audience rather than a conversation. And that has additional tools that can be really helpful. Like uh, instead of letting people chat to everyone, you can say people can chat to these moderators who will relay the questions. And so for big meetings where you want some participation but you have a bigger team to moderate the conversation and you want a really controlled approach, Zoom webinars is usually the right tool. It's of course more expensive, right? You know. Uh, it's a sad truth that um, uh, more money gets you more uh, uh, protection most of the time. And then um, for the, I know our audience is a mix of folks who are at, you know, Penn, uh, you know, employees or faculty and folks who are outside of Penn in the broader community. So, but this is more of a message targeted at those Penn folks. Uh, Penn's IT is broken up into many small teams called local service providers. And they um, all manage Zoom in different ways, have different tools and different specialties to support the folks in their area. 
So if you're thinking about which platform should I choose and you're a pen person, or you're thinking, how do we do this here? How do we integrate with our Canvas system? How do we do recordings of classes? Um, you know, your local service provider is a great person to talk to. So they're, they're really the, the frontline support and they can give you the answer that's specific to your situation. If you uh, work or, or organize somewhere else, you know, um, getting hands-on help is still a really good idea, right? There's always somebody who can assist, get in touch with that person. This is especially true for sort of corporate Zoom accounts where um, your administrator in the background can change settings. So we're gonna talk about, you should set this, you shouldn't set this. Well, they might've already put new defaults on there that automatically set most of these settings, or you might not be able to find a setting because it's set and not, you're not allowed to change it, um, depending on who set up your Zoom. So just worth keeping that in mind if, if you're sort of following along in your account sometime and you're re-watching this video and you say, this doesn't make sense, that could be why. And then, one last nod, I'm going to talk about sort of two slides here, defensive principles. And the first one is just risk management, right? Um, whenever we're having a conversation, there's a risk of somebody in that conversation misbehaving. So we're going to go through all these steps about how to basically reduce the avenues for that uh, today and how to be prepared to respond if somebody is disruptive. But there's a conversation, there's some risk. Um, if you go through and take every step that I've described today, you'll really, you know, for every Zoom meeting, some of those Zoom meetings will get really limited in their capabilities. When a lot of times you want to have people's faces, you want to be able to uh, fluidly say, oh, let me share this image I found here. Oh, wait, let me, let me share this. You know, it's a great collaboration tool. And a lot of what we are talking about um, does reduce those avenues for collaboration. And so my hope is that by understanding what tools are available to you and what the adversaries that you're up against are, that you can make a, an informed decision about risk for any given Zoom meeting. And when we are trying to manage that risk, I'm gonna uh, propose that there's sort of three things we're trying to get done. Similar to the way we were talking about our, our threat, um, you know, our profiling our threats. Um, and we're gonna talk about what, what are our categories of defenses. So first, let's avoid having these people join our meetings. So don't let them find them, don't let them join. We can then assume that that's not gonna work all the time. So we're gonna control how participants can, communi can communicate so that we can limit avenues for harassment. And then we're gonna assume that because we want some collaboration, some conversation in a lot of these meetings, that there's still gonna be avenues for people to misbehave. And so we're gonna be ready to react. So uh, this is where it gets a little bit, uh, you know, not, I'm gonna get through some of this a little bit quick. Don't worry if every step doesn't make sense. The video is gonna be recorded. You can go back and review when you can click around and zoom and do this on your own. But let's talk about where to find the settings and what settings to set. I'm gonna, um, like I said, we're not gonna go slow enough that, uh, because it's definitely boring, um, that you know you could do it all at once while we're going along, but this way you'll have it for reference. And then that way we can get to some questions and conversation. So Zoom, like a lot of modern tools, you know, they say, oh, you can do it this way, you can do it that way, you can do it however you want, which sometimes is kind of worse, right? It's harder to figure out what you can do and what you can't do, what you should do and how to do it. So, um, Zoom, we're going to talk about two big locations that you can uh, configure things in Zoom. One, you can go to what I, you know, I'm going to call the web settings uh, for your Zoom account and change how, you, how your meetings start by default. So what do your meetings normally look like? How do they uh, start? And then during individual meetings, you can make changes during the meeting, um, inside the meeting. And then remember, get help, especially if you know, you're sort of saying, I'm not understanding this. Or I don't know how to do this. You know, your, your LSP at Penn can really assist you with that. So how to get to the web settings, right? Oh, First, sorry. you have, oh, go ahead. Oh, uh, the local service provider, your IT support at Penn. Um, so whoever you would call with an IT problem, they invariably will be able to help you with uh, Zoom at Penn. So, and there's um, a bunch of different groups like that. So it's it's just worth, um, and some of them are gonna have different ways of doing things that are more custom for the, the organization that people are coming from. But to get started, um, either, um, you know, and like I say, Zoom, you know, you can do it a hundred different ways. Most of us will have a Zoom app either on like the phone or, our, or you know, a tablet that we're using for Zoom or on the laptop or desktop computer. When you go into that app, you know, you'll have something that looks like this and there'll be a gear somewhere on the screen. On a regular computer, you know, it's um, in the top right on mobile, or at least when I tried it on mobile, it was on the top left. But that gear is going to get you to your first sort of setting screen, which will look like this. Um, I'm gonna suggest that it's easier to skip these settings and go uh, under general and select view more settings. And that'll bring you to a web page where you'll be asked to log in. And that's how you get into your sort of web version of your Zoom account. And now some of you might say like, I can just go right there. And you're absolutely right. Um, just go, you can just skip to that step. But 
uh, I couldn't come up with a universal way to say, like, go to your login page because people log in different places depending on how your Zoom account's set up. But basically, you want to log into your Zoom web account, um, you know, and that gets you to where, you know, you can see um, a, a page that's got all sorts of things down the left, you know, your profile, your meetings, webinars, recordings, and you want to go to settings there. And then depending on the size of the screen that you're viewing things on, this will look a little differently, but somewhere on that screen, it'll say settings and then select settings. And then there's a bunch of subcategories of settings. Um, many of them are insecurity, the ones that we're going to talk about, but a lot of them are things like, you know, basic meetings, meetings advanced. So, you know, we're just going to ignore the subheadings and it's somewhere under settings. And it's basically a big long list on a web page where you can, uh, uh, you know, uh, go through and, and they get, you know, a list of all different things, ways you can customize Zoom. And we'll talk about the ones that are sort of relevant to Zoom meetings that um, we're worried about harassment in. So the alternative is during a meeting. If you're a host or a co-host, you know, and you hover over the screen, it's got all the people, you know, pictured on it. There's a bar that comes up at the bottom and it's got things like mute, start video, and if you're a host, you should have a, um, an option for security. And um, it's always good, especially if you're running a meeting where you're worried that there might be harassment or there's a lot to manage, um, you know, setting several people as co-hosts, you know, your trusted partners, um, like we have today, so that somebody can monitor the chat, somebody can, you know, uh, mute somebody when they join the room, or if they, you know, uh, forget to go off mute when they answer a phone call, things like that. It helps to have a team. And everyone on that team should be, you know, a host or a co-host. If they're, and these are trusted people, right, they can really take over your meeting, so be careful who you promote. Um, and, you know, they have this security button down at the bottom and that gives you all these other options that, you know, you can set those things on the web settings or you can change them for the particular meeting you're in, um, in the particular meeting. And so, um, two spots, we're going to be jumping back and forth between them a little bit because some things are easier in one location versus another, but we'll try to, I'll try to be clear about where we're talking about. Hopefully all that makes sense. Because then we'll, now we'll just talk through explaining what some of these different settings do and how they can be used to protect the Zoom meeting. So we're going to go through first how to avoid people finding your meetings or how to avoid letting them get into the meetings. So the first thing, as you saw today, we have a waiting room enabled. So I would set this under your web settings and just set it for all your meetings. Um, it's not a super big inconvenience and it gives you a lot of control over who can be in your meeting, right? If somebody tries to join and you don't recognize them and it's a small sort of private meeting, well, you just don't let them in, problem solved. You know, in a big meeting, yeah, you have to click and let people in, but it lets you, uh, it gives you a lot more granular control over who's coming in and when they're coming in. Similarly, I suggest um, in the web settings, disable the setting for allow participants to join before host. That way you're in control of your meeting because you're always present during your meeting. And so if people try to join before you, you're running a minute late, there'll just be a, a you know, screen that says, oh, you know, wait for the meeting to start. Again, not a big inconvenience, um, but you know, it gives you more control over the meeting and that way things don't get out of control before you get there to you know, uh, be able to react if somebody causes trouble. And then I don't, this is one of the ones where Zoom kind of you know, got picked on early in the uh, pandemic. By default, this setting allow removed participants to rejoin was enabled. So you know, back in March you know, of last year, you would uh, kick somebody out of your meeting for yelling obscenities at people and they could just walk right back in. And it's like, Zoom, what are you doing to us? So, you know, I really, you're probably not kicking anybody out of a meeting that you want to come back. So now if you're in a situation where you think that might come up, you know, maybe disable the setting for that meeting, but, or I mean, enable this setting, but otherwise keep this turned off all the time. Similarly, uh, Zoom has a whole bunch of different passcode settings, um, which are you know, basically passcode, password, same thing, you know, different techie word for it. Um, the, we want to turn them all on is the short version. They have a bunch of different things, you know, re require a passcode for people joining by phone is probably the one that's the most annoying. But if you require a passcode for everyone who doesn't join by phone, people, the, the people who want to irritate you are, they know that, right? They're going to try to join your meeting when they can't join without the passcode, they're going to try dialing into the meeting. And if they get right in, then you know, we'll be back where we started with them harassing us. So there's a number of different pa uh, passcode uh, settings, um, especially the, you know, many people, if they use Zoom, will have sort of a Zoom uh, default meeting that you can use or your own, you know, your sort of personal uh, meeting and, uh, you know, personal meeting ID. I really recommend um, requiring a passcode there because if you invite somebody to a meeting, they're in a, a meeting that they're supposed to be in with you in your personal meeting. And then they leave or whatever, um, 
and they want to return some other time, you know, you could be having a totally different meeting and they could just jump right back in. So it's best to change that passcode occasionally. Um, you know, you can go in here and change it up and, you know, just keep a passcode on that meeting so people can't just join at any time. And it's a little inconvenient, but I think it's worth it. And then uh, once people are in the meeting, let's talk about how we control the communications. And this, again, is where I think we have a lot of those risk trade-offs where if you turn off everything, then you're not really having a meeting anymore. It's just a, a one-to-many lecture. Um, so, you know, you want to make a, a risk-based decision on sort of um, how much risk can you tolerate in the meeting? You know, generally more people in the meeting is more risky, so you want to be more controlled um, and more restrictive, but, you know, you can make an informed decision. So um, screen sharing, I think, you know, host only is the better setting, but sometimes you're going to want to collaborate with people where everyone's sharing images and, you know, um, you know, we're working on a document together and, you know, people say, oh, let me show you my section, you know, we're doing homework together. Well, you probably want to turn sharing on or promote many people to host, but Again, only promote trusted partners to host because they can take over the meeting, kick you out, and now it's their meeting. Um, again, unless you're sharing files specifically, I would disable file transfers. And then again, unless you're collaborating in a way where you're using screen annotations, you know, which a lot of people don't use, I would just turn those off and say only the user who is sharing can annotate their screen. Similarly here, um, we've, you know, on this one, these are web settings that you can set. Um, it's easiest, you can set this in the web or you can set it during a meeting. So I have a little screenshot of after you hit the, the security button down at the bottom, you can uh, change all these things to say, you know, I can, people can share screens, they can't. Can they chat? Okay, they can't. Can they rename themselves? Can they unmute themselves? Can they start their video? And you know, that, that um, you can turn all those off. Um, you could turn them all on. Um, you know, if you uh, allow participants to do more, it's more risky. If you turn all those things off, it's, you know, there's uh, less collaboration. And I have to say, normally, I feel like in this field of information security where, you know, we get painted with a broad brush and people say, well, you know, you make things more secure, but less functional. And I often argue against that. I say, no, we got all these good ways to do it here. It really is more secure, less functional. You know, it's, it's, it's just a straight trade off. Um, the There are some web settings where you can um, start people as with, um, so like, Today, you know, and we might have it set so that you can't enable video, but you can start with your video on. You can go in the web settings and say, um, like, mute all participants when they join. Um, and that way when they, you know, because just saying they can't unmute themselves, confusingly doesn't mean they can't join while unmuted. So uh, then you, you know, but when you mute them once, then they, uh, you know, aren't able to unmute. You know, you got to have everything be as confusing as possible in these tech tools. So yeah, yeah, I should have uh, waited for this slide, right? So in, in the web settings, enable mute all participants when they join. And then, um, you know, people, there's a, um, in the participants, you can like raise your hand and things like that. And then you can say, okay, I'm gonna select one user's portrait and say, ask to unmute. For um, our participants in a meeting, their privacy, you can't unmute without their permission. So, you know, but you can say, ask to unmute and that gives them the chance to unmute. Then they can talk and then they can either mute themselves or you can place them back on mute. So you can sort of have a, it's like passing the microphone at a big meeting, right? You have some control over who has the microphone um, and it's not a free for all, but it can be, you know, you can still have people speaking. Now, once somebody has the microphone, you don't know what they're gonna say, but you have more control over, you know, exactly who you, you know, um, who has the microphone. There's not any confusion if things go off the rails. And then, you know, similarly, you can disable the chat and then you can disable private chats too, which, um, you know, they, they're uh, covered separately in the Zoom settings. And private chats are, you know, right now, like today, we can send chat messages all to everyone in the participant um, in the lobby. But um, you could also send chats one person to one other person, which if you're really trying to lock down a meeting, maybe you want to avoid that so that, you know, a participant can't harass a specific individual or, or things like that. Um, the um, downside, go ahead. I, I'm um, just, someone just said that they weren't able to chat. Hmm. And I'm just, because I think that I opened, enable chat in my settings and i'm wondering if there's something you know in terms of enabling or disabling chat is there are there other things in there that you need to change so that people can send messages it should be i mean i'm looking i'm not sure if it's sharing my, my screen uh, viewing the uh, video the, okay. the, the the settings but you know chat is a lot of participants to chat is oh wait here we go let's I think that we have it maybe backwards here. There we go. Uh, folks, uh, give another try chatting and see if that works now. Somebody said it works. There we go. It's on. Yep. 
Okay, great. Sorry about that. You know, this is uh, when you let these security people in here, they just lock everything down like crazy. They're, you can't trust us. <laughs> All right. And so, uh, you know, now we even have that. Okay, good. We got it. Thanks for letting us know about that. And then um, one of the disadvantages of the platform we're on now, Zoom meetings, is that you can't have like uh, an easy setup where you can say people can only chat with the moderators. Um, Zoom webinars has that feature, and for big meetings, it, it's probably the better tool. It has a bunch of other good features, too. And then um, we talked previously about, you know, there's just a setting in there on the web settings to disallow, uh, disallow participants to rename themselves, and you can also set that under that security button. And then um, high participant profile pictures in a meeting is another one you can set just to say, well, we don't want to, you know, if we're worried about people sharing, um, you know, uh, rude uh, uh, profile pictures, we can just disable those so that everyone just shows up as their name. And you know, we saw what their name was before we let them in because we had the meeting, uh, the waiting room. But like we said, there's always risk to when you have these collaborative discussions, you know, somebody can be uh, uncollaborative. So we want to be ready to react. And there's two main ways that you're going to be able to react. One is you click on a, um, I guess maybe three, right? Um, basically, you want to, you, you know which person is causing a problem, and you want to um, limit their ability to cause that problem. So you can either pick, click on their portrait or their name in the participants menu, you know, during a meeting. And there's going to be a button that says more, like by this red arrow. And, you know, you can say stop video or, you know, you can uh, be sort of granular about what you want to do with them. You know, you can click mute next to the more button. Um, but the best one is probably just remove, right? If somebody's causing a problem, they're harassing people, just remove them from the meeting. That solves that problem. And because removed participants can't rejoin because we set that setting, they're out. Um, the report button is similar, um, but it's it'll also remove them from the meeting, but it's going to ask you questions before it does so. And um, but that has the advantage of it reports them to Zoom, uh, you know, headquarters. Right. And Zoom has a uh, I forget what they call, it, but basically a team that's trying to make their platform safer to use. And so that team will then review what you uh, described. Um, you know, if you check that box that says include a desktop screenshot, it'll screenshot the meeting. So if you have something sensitive there, that's going to get sent to Zoom. But if you have evidence of the harassment that'll also get sent. And, um, you know, you can click on that drop down what happened and, you know, uh, explain a little bit what happened. And um, people who consistently misuse the platform to harass people, uh, Zoom bans them from the platform. So, uh, which, uh, you know, is one way to try to keep things safer and, you know, one way to have a little bit of consequences for some of these disruptive folks. Let's see. The other tool that Zoom put into their uh, thing is we, under the security button, there's in red, it's suspend all participant activities. So if you're, uh, sometimes somebody starts doing something, you say, I don't know what they're doing. I know that they're harassing people, but I, I'm, you know, I don't do this all day in Zoom. I'm not sure how to stop what they're doing, um, or there's multiple people, or if you know, I'm losing control of this meeting in some way, you can uh, basically put everything on hold. You can suspend all participant activities. It turns off everyone's video, turns off their audio, stops sharing the slides. It basically puts the meeting on, on a freeze while you figure out what's going on. Then you can go through and see who was doing what kind of, you know, what, because you can stop everything, go through, remove the people you need to remove and then restart the meeting. So that can be, you know, useful from that perspective. So that's sort of the, the big red button to say, something's going wrong, let's stop this. So um, those are the, the settings I was going to go over. It's not too many of them, but they're uh, you know uh, worth talking about. I'm going to talk about a few other um, settings and things like that. But if, if folks have questions now, uh, that have already been posted, um, um, we could talk about them, or we'll talk about them in a minute. So far, Great. no questions. Chat. Right. No, nope, that makes sense. So uh, I do have a question. When you, if you go ahead. If you suspend all activities, mm -hmm. people don't, they're not getting kicked off. They're just like being muted from video mm -hmm. and sound. Right. You, you'll pick the specific people who you want to kick out. But if, um, you know, if somebody's, you know, you're not sure, you know, you're looking at a big meeting and there's, you know, 900 portraits and you're trying to say, which one of these is lighting up and who's doing this? You can suspend all activities to mute everyone, stop all screen sharing and basically sort of put the whole meeting on pause, but it doesn't kick everyone out. It doesn't end the meeting. Okay. Oh, okay. So you might decide to turn there to end the meeting. Identify. Yep, yeah, it basically gives you a moment to sort of stop the harm and get control of the meeting and get the people who need to leave out of the meeting. Okay. Great. So um, 
I wanted to point out two settings that uh, Zoom has that are a little more, uh, uh, they're very good settings, but they're, they're kind of advanced and they, can, they tend to break things. Oh. So on those web settings, there's only authenticated users can join meetings. And uh, this is a good setting if you wanna have a meeting that's like just for your team, right? So you say, hey, I have my team at work and we all wanna to get together on Zoom and it's a sensitive topic. So I, I, only, I don't want anybody coming in here. If you all log into Zoom the same way, because then under this setting, it's going to say, well, well, which kind of authenticated users count? And it's going to ask you sort of like, you know, if you work at ABC company, it'll say, oh, only ABC.com users can join. And you say, yeah, that, that's great. And um, then only people who log in through their ABC.com Zoom accounts can join and you're all set. Um, and that kind of limits your um, exposure to outsiders. Uh, the challenge is if you have um, people collaborating across different organizations, it can be tricky to make sure that you get um, all the kinds of authentication that count. And um, especially, I know we have a lot of Penn folks in the audience today, like you'd expect. At Penn, there's not one way to tell Zoom, oh, Penn people. Um, we have probably, I don't know, a dozen different, um, uh, you know, Penn to Zoom relationships. So Zoom doesn't, like at a technical level, understand what Penn is. It thinks we're a dozen different companies. And so if you select this option and you say like, oh, only pen people, a lot of different pen people still won't be able to join. So um, I would avoid this option for now. I mean, unless you're sort of in a, you know, using a different Zoom environment where you say like, oh, everyone works at the same company. We all have our accounts the same way. Then this works great. And end-to-end uh, -end encryption. I'm going to um, go to the next slide to talk about this a little bit. So um, the long story short on how it uh, breaks things is end-to-end uh, -end encryption is this feature where uh, well, if you turn it on, it breaks a bunch of stuff. Look under the setting to see, it, it lists the things it breaks. And so it lists things like um, people dialing in on the phone, um, people dialing in from like room conference systems, uh, recording meetings to the cloud. It breaks a lot of stuff. Um, so uh, let's talk a little bit about whether you would need to use it and what, what it's good for. So um, encryption doesn't really help us against harassment, but while we're talking about safety and security of Zoom meetings, it's a good topic, right? So um, let's step back and talk about what encryption is. Basically encryption is encoding a message in a way that prevents somebody who has access to the message from being able to read it unless they have the key. So uh, the, by default on the internet, um, you know, uh, people use this metaphor, it's like sending a postcard through the mail and the postman can read the postcard without doing anything. And encryption is like putting that, um, that your, your letter inside an envelope and then the postman while he's delivering the mail uh, can't see what's in the letter. And you know, um, encryption is mathematically uh, uh, based, and you know, it's uh, without the key you can't get into the envelope. Now, but the thing is, right? The postman, um, um, our metaphorical postman on the internet, isn't the source of our harassment. Um, you know, so we're not really normally worried about encryption. And Zoom has fine encryption, right? By default, Zoom meetings are encrypted, and um, the uh, metaphorical internet postman, you know, basically, uh, you know, Comcast or Verizon. Um, or whoever is you know, transmitting our, our transmission across the internet, generally, um, we're not that worried about them. But for some topics, some locations, um, the, we are worried about somebody who has access to those transmissions, uh, monitoring those transmissions, so, and then uh, trying to you know, decode them. So um, Zoom's regular um, encryption is normally sufficient. So um, if we were on uh, sending postcards and I was trying to intercept postcards, I would go either, I would go near your house, right? Um, because trying to pick them out of the post office would be hard. So normally, um, if somebody, you know, a sort of mundane attack that's trying to listen to you on the wire might be somebody at the same coffee shop as you, um, or at the same hotel, or in the same building. Um, but that's not really a thing that hackers do right now. You know, it's, it's not a big risk, and Zoom by default is protected against that. Where end-to-end -end encryption comes into play is like, uh, if instead of sending it in an envelope, you wanted to send it in a safe, you know, like a big, you know, Acme novelty safe with a big dial on the front. Um, and... Uh, because Zoom's regular encryption, um, basically Zoom has the key and can read it, but we're not generally worried about Zoom corporate reading our communications, right? They don't, they're not that interested. But um, at the start of the pandemic, people realized, hey, Zoom's a US company, but they have like hundreds of engineers in China. And well, can the Chinese government, you know, put pressure on those engineers to read our, our, uh, our messages or listen in on our conversations, especially if maybe we're having a conversation um, that was sensitive in, in the Chinese context. Um, and then, you know, people said, well, that's really true about a lot of places in the world, right? Um, you know, and uh, from different points of view than maybe US citizens, um, the United States government is well known to do this kind of thing too, right? So Zoom built a system of end-to-end -end encryption that lets you protect against that. 
where only the people in the conversation had the keys. And Zoom doesn't have the keys, so no matter what country issues a legal order against Zoom, in you know, what's legal in different countries changes. So a US court order comes to Zoom and says, hey, give us that conversation. Zoom can say, I, I'd love to, but I don't have the key. So even if I, I wanted to comply, I couldn't. So that's really, really robust if we're worried about something like a country listening into the conversation. But if you're not, you know, um, then it breaks a lot of things and causes a lot of trouble. So I wouldn't turn that setting on. So that's a long digression, but um, it's a confusing topic. So we just wanted to touch base on it. And then one other one that this has not a lot to do with meeting safety, but it's it's an interesting topic for Zoom that I just wanted to put in people's minds. Um, one way that I guess it's a little bit safety related, right? One way Zoom tries to protect meetings and make them more safe for um, different audiences that use Zoom is by giving watermarking options. And uh, basically what these are is for people who are worried that the meeting's gonna be surreptitiously recorded, either using the Zoom record function, you know, that people know is being recorded, but then somebody's gonna leak that recording, or, you know, somebody's gonna take their cell phone and, you know, secretly out of the corner of the, you know, videotape it, and then, um, you know, share that tape and say, oh, here's the, the secret meeting that I was in, and, you know, here's, here's this. So um, the more straightforward watermark just, it puts your name on your screen. So if you record the screen, people will know it was you who recorded it when you leaked the video. Um, the more surreptitious version is audio watermarking that um, makes it so the audio each person hears um, has the same effective equivalent of putting your name on the screen. Um, they encode your name into the audio you hear um, as basically um, high-pitched dog whistle uh, chirps. And um, there's a, you know, Zoom tries to make you aware of this. They display an icon on the screen when the audio watermark is enabled. But it's not obvious to me what that um, icon means. It's like a little like audio wave with a lock. If I saw it, I wouldn't know that that meant that my name was included in the audio I was hearing so that if I recorded that audio, somebody would figure out it was me who recorded it instead of another meeting participant. So both this is a tool that can be useful to you if you are trying to prevent a meeting from being leaked. Um, and it's worth knowing about just in case uh, you're in a meeting and you say like, somebody should know about this meeting. Well, you should know about watermarking before you make your next decision. And then similarly, um, people have gotten tripped up by meeting recording on Zoom. In particular, um, private messages um, sent. So like, a, you know, if we're chatting in, in Zoom and, um, you know, the, the global chat, you know, the, you know, everyone's chatting with everyone in the text. Um, well, that gets pu pulled as part of the recording and people expect that. But each person who, uh, or when somebody records the meeting, um, you know, you're using Zoom's recording tools, uh, it can also capture private messages sent between one person and another person can also be included in the recording. And now there's a lot of um, asterisks and subtleties to when that happens. I would, uh, the easiest assumption is to say, if you chat in a Zoom meeting, uh, whoever uh, hosts or records that Zoom meeting or whoever views the recording later might see what you chat. Uh, so it's just worth keeping in mind as a, you know, if you want to send somebody a private message, uh, Go uh, look at the other uh, uh, great uh, video that uh, Valerie had me do with her and use the, uh, uh, the texting tool signal. That'll keep your message private. And, you know, that, that, that's the content we had, you know, and, and in, you know, just summary, keep people out of the meeting by avoiding them finding it, control what they can do in the meeting and really be ready to react. And we'll be able to, you know, keep our meetings more safe. I'd love to answer any questions you have. Um, I'm probably going to stop screen sharing so that we, you know, these slides will stop, you know, dominating our view and we'll go from there. So while others might be gathering, I just, I, I just wrote in the chat what you said that if you chat in the Zoom meeting, that the host can see your chat. Is that like if I said a message? Mm -hmm. Wow. So um, the, it, and it's all about um, sort of that Zoom's documentation will explain how it's basically the only the per it, you can only view things in the your recording only captures things you had access to to begin with. But what that means at a technical level is often not what people expected it to mean. Mm -hmm. okay. So um, it's uh, not 100% of the time, but you know. Thank you. I oh, just, and um, I see in the chat that folks are saying that, you know, we have the microphone disabled. Yeah, if, if you could type your question, that, that would be uh, really helpful. Or, um, but, Carla, or if uh, we can unmute, yeah. Carla Anderson just asked, just raised her hand mm -hmm. and I asked her to oh, unmute great. so she could ask her question. Hi, everyone. Great. Hello. 
So I, I also just wanted more clarity on the, uh, the private chatting and also the saving of chats because I was told that if you save a chat, for instance, um, in a recorded meeting, the private messages among the hosts, for instance, do, are not recorded in the, rec the saved chat, just things that are sent out to everyone. Is that true or not true? Uh, the, the reason that these all call, you know, get us into so much trouble is because the, um, it, like everything's like true with an asterisk. So um, the, I would test, uh, you know, and it depends on how your meeting is set up and how you're configured um, as far as I can tell. So um, I think if you save the chat, it should just save the chat that you're trying to save, like the main chat. But um, it's worth checking what you have before you, you share with other folks it is the long story. It, the, I've spent a while trying to research this and try to uh, come up with a concise way of putting all the information. And it seemed to come down to just double check what you have before you share the recording or the save chat. Does anybody else have a question? I would like to pose a question. Can you still use these same features um, on a uh, on a mobile device, like a telephone? Are they same? Are they still available the same way on a cell phone? Yeah, in general. So the um, when you're um, if you're using a phone or tablet, you'll still have that um, like the security button on the bottom. You know, it's next to your mute button or your stop video button, and you can do yeah. all the same options there. And uh, the, so, you know, that, that in meeting stuff is a very similar experience and the web settings where you set, like say, um, uh, use a waiting room or don't use a waiting room. You can just set that on the web and it'll work on your phone, your laptop, wherever you, wherever you set a meeting up from. Okay. So Carla had a follow-up question. Mm Hi, just a follow up to the chat. You said that there actually may be multiple uh, uh, forms of your chat that are downloaded when you go to save the chat. Like you can choose whether you just want to download and save uh, the host posts or the participants. Like, are there different mm -hmm. iterations of the chat you can save? Um, I think, and you know, I got to say, I'm, I'm, uh, this is why I'm saying I would double check and test because I haven't done it. Um, you know, I, I played around with it before this meeting, but I'm not 100% sure. Um, I think it might just be save chat. Um, but like, for example, there's a setting on the web you can set to disable saving the chat. And so when, you know, uh, somebody goes to save the chat, they might say, I can't save the chat. What are you talking about? I'm not sure if there's another setting that can make that more granular, but I think it should just save uh, the general chat. But my understanding from Zoom is it will save chats that you have access to. So um, the uh, this is why I would test. So if you say had a conversation with your co-host on the side and then you had the gen general chat, when you say save chat, I would double check that it doesn't also capture that conversation with the co-host. Uh, because uh, I know that I've seen um, you know discussion around how people have gotten tripped up by that. And so it's just an area to, to be cautious with and double check. Okay. Aman has a question in the chat. Um, do you want to ask your question or should I just read it? I can ask it. Okay. Um, so my question is about the audio watermarking feature that you just described. And um, does the audio watermarking feature work on an individual basis? For example, if mm -hmm. I host an event where I want to record the, the presenter's um, presentation or a faculty member's presentation, um, but I don't want to record an audience member or participants audio, let's say they're like a K through 12 student who's asking mm -hmm. a question and, um, you know, is, is that possible? Um, you know, I, I think, and this is again, I, um, I, I'm not, this is where people often think I should know most answers about how to do things. I'm really only good at breaking things. So I'm not sure about how to, um, the watermarking shouldn't interact with what you're trying to do. 
um, basically, you know, you can uh, record which parts you want or not record. I think um, by default, it would record um, everything, sort of like a participant view. So if people see the K through 12 student ask a lot of question, that would get included in the recording and you'd have to edit it out. But I'm not 100% sure there. What the watermarking does is um, if you had uh, 12 people in a meeting um, and uh, later the meeting audio shows up on YouTube and you say, hey, who did this? Who posted this audio? We were supposed to have this meeting in confidence. Um, the, you know, the, the audio would be that you all heard the same audio during the meeting. So you, you can't tell who recorded it that way, but the watermark, the audio watermark would have added each of your names to the audio that was played to you. So if you record the audio, it'll have your name on it. And if, um, you know, Jane Doe records the audio, it'll say Jane Doe in, you know, hidden in her audio. So it, it shows who recorded it, but it doesn't change what was recorded. Hopefully that makes sense. It's a really confusing feature is basically why I brought it up because I think most people haven't heard of it. And I don't know, I think we should all have transparency and know what the software we're using can do to us. Ansel asks, could you edit a chat as the host? Could you edit the chat before it is saved or could you prevent a chat from being saved? That's a good question. I think you can prevent a chat from being saved. Um, now. Basically, there's a web setting, you know, when, you know, when we go to those settings that we were looking at and you can select prevent, uh, like allow chat to be saved, disallow chat to be saved. So you can turn off chat saving. Um, but I think, um, I don't know that there's a native function to edit the chat, but I think if you save it, you could probably open it in another format and make changes to it. Um, but I'm not 100% sure there. I'm, I'm out on a, a ledge there. I haven't tried it. And, you know, until you try it, I'm not sure. Um, so I just want to make a general statement. Um, you, if, if you put a question in the chat from this point forward, we'll read it. If you want to ask a question, if you raise your hand and if you look on your screen on reactions, there is an option that says raise hand, then we will allow you to unmute and ask the question. Uh, Colleen, I think, had a question. I do. Um... I was trying to go along as you were talking about this to see if I could actually do it and I couldn't. But when you talked about to the reacting to dis disruption, you said view participants and select the individual. And I tried to do that and I couldn't actually select them. And then you said go to more and remove a report. And I went to more and I didn't see the remove a report. So can you talk a little bit more about that? So um, that's um, if you're in this meeting, um, if, since you're not uh, set as a host, um, you won't see those options. But if you set up your own meeting uh, as the host, you'll see those options. So you're looking in the right place from your description. Okay, so you have to be the host. Okay. Mm -hmm. Yep. Um, Isabel asks, um, are there consequences? And if so, what are the consequences for people mm -hmm. who do Zoom bombings? Right, yeah, so I mean, uh, the most prominent consequences that I'm aware of. So, you know, um, depending on law enforcement, whatever partnership, you know, if you, uh, I know that some people, you know, uh, if you Zoom bomb a meeting at your own company or school, uh, well, your company or school can enforce consequences on you if they figure out that you did it. And they have some pretty good tools to figure out if you did it. Um, but, um, you know, a lot of these people are harassing people they've never met and they've never worked with. But Zoom has done a pretty good job of um, trying to uh, make there be consequences for people on the Zoom platform. So um, the, I've talked with the Zoom safety and security team. You know, they were nice and just gave us an introduction and described what they were doing. And they've got some, um, uh, some heavy hitter lawyers on that team who are good at, making, uh, good at doing investigations, figuring out uh, what people have been up to, and then banning them from the platform if, if they've been causing trouble. And they have um, multiple ways of making it hard for like, so when they ban you from the platform, they can do that in multiple ways. So like today I signed, it, signed into Zoom using my PAN account. If I go and cause trouble tonight using my PAN account, they'll kick me off of, of Zoom with my PAN account. They'll shut it down and say, hey, sorry, PAN, we're not taking your money to let this guy on the platform. He's out. Um, and they won't let you back on. They're, they're pretty firm about that if, if you cause trouble and they, and they catch you. Um, and then uh, similarly, they can basically, if they're, um, one of the reasons why Zoom bombing became popular on Zoom is you don't necessarily need to log into an account to use Zoom. You can just hit that meeting link and join. Mm -hmm. um, so if they don't know who you are, they might make your computer no longer work on Zoom. Um, so they can basically say, hey, if that, we see that computer again, I know what, you know, 
from a technical level, I, I recognize that computer. It's not allowed in here. Some jerk was using it. He's not allowed. So, um, and you know, that's not necessarily uh, commensurate with the harm in that I think people should deserve some more firm consequences than that. But that's what um, we see happening. And, you know, I, I have to give it to Zoom. They, they, they suffered a lot of, uh, uh, you know, like I said, we call it Zoom bombing when, you know, it's not called, uh, I don't know, Slack bombing or, or Google Meet bombing. Um, but Zoom really did step up over the last year and invest a lot and try to make their platform safer. And I, I have to give them credit for that. Thank you. Um, there's a question uh, from Brian. With the function that suspends all participant activity, how do participants know that it's being used and how, you know, how do they know that you're not just um, ending the meeting and for trying to prevent, right. you know, try to prevent someone from leaving prematurely? You know, um, I think that probably, I'm going to propose that the last thing we should do on this call is suspend it and see what happens and we'll all see what, what, what works live. I believe they'll get a notice that says this meeting suspended for temporarily, something like that, but it was hard for me to test on my own with just my account. So I think that, you know, at uh, 359, we should try suspending it and then try bringing it back and see how yeah, it goes. I, I think we should do that. So, but I, and I think also you could say like, oh my gosh, guys, I'm going to suspend a meeting and kick these guys out and I'll be right back. And hopefully, but you know, you never know with things going on. It might be really chaotic. So let's try it out. So you can tell me if you can't answer this question, but Mm -hmm. Some pen departments use blue jeans. Some are using Microsoft mm -hmm. Teams, and some are using Zoom. Is one of those better than the other? So, uh, I think the, you know, I mean, if I thought one was really better than the other, I'd just tell you because what are they going to do? Um, but the, I think they're all pretty similar, um, and then each have some strengths and weaknesses that make them better or worse for certain things. Um, so Blue Jeans um, has the longest history as a telemedicine platform, in my opinion, um, and so uh, kind of comes out of healthcare. So they're um, they've got some really good features because of that. I really like them for um, you know as, as a tool for that. Um, Microsoft Teams has more. Um, if you're trying to do like file collaboration, documentation collaboration, you know, um, it's it's built around sort of a more full suite of collaboration, and it's got some great tools like uh, Microsoft OneDrive, which is a good tool for sharing documents. Forgive me for this digression. Uh, one of the challenges there is that um, some people at Penn um, have two-step uh, verification configured for their Microsoft accounts and some people don't. I suggest talking to your local service provider and asking that it be configured for your account. It makes it a ton more secure. With two-step enabled and with using Microsoft Teams to um, only allow access to particular accounts, um, it, it's a really tough platform to Zoom bomb. So. Um, you know how Zoom, you know, you can just share a link and get in a meeting and it's quick and easy. Mm -hmm. um, with Teams, you can kind of do that, but it's more default functionality is to say, I want this account, this account, and this account to join. Um, and if you make it hard, if those accounts are really well controlled and hard to break into, then it's really tough to get into a Zoom meeting you're not, or a, a Teams meeting you're not invited to. Um, where I think Zoom excels is that um, if you're dealing with a situation where you're worried about something that end-to-end -end encryption is a solution for, so you say, I want to talk about this sensitive topic. This might irritate, um, you know, I'm, I'm giving a presentation on the, uh, the NSA of the United States and uh, the Edward Snowden leaks. And, you know, some of my collaborators have been harassed by um, national security forces in the United States before. And I'm worried they're going to eavesdrop on us or harass us. Well, Zoom is a really good platform for that because um, they have the best end-to-end -end encryption tools because they lost the most money and got the most stock, uh, shareholder pressure about not having good security. So they have really innovated in that space in the last year. Um, so, uh, but they're all, I mean, from my perspective, they're all pretty darn safe. Um, uh, and so the best one is the one you know how to use the best and that you're, um, the people you want to talk to know how to use the best because any of these can be configured to be really robust. And so um, whichever one you know the settings for, whichever one you can kick somebody out of the fastest, that's the one you should use. Okay. Just making sure that I didn't miss any questions. And while I'm looking, if anyone has a question, either raise your hand or put it in the chat. This was very informative for me. I've taken a lot of notes. Right. Yeah, and you know, we'll have the recording up there so people can uh, check it out later and try it out on their own. And you know, I think I'm really looking forward to suspending the meeting and seeing if it ruins everything. And then you can say, I don't trust this guy's advice at all. What, he hey, doesn't know what he's doing. And I'm actually going to make you the host so that you can do it. <laughs>
<laughs> Why don't you want to hit that big red button? Come on, it'll be fun. I don't want to hit the big red button. <laughs> but before you do that, um, <laughs> let me just thank you for giving us your time and this information. I know that yes, yes. it has been very helpful to me. And I know that we are going to be using virtual uh, meetings and conferences well into the future. Um, so we need to always be aware of this information. I thank you for your information and for your support. You're getting a lot of accolades in the chat, which I'm going to save. <laughs> and um, I am going to end this and say thank you. Everybody, we're going to try, use your reactions and let's give him a round of applause. Yay! Yeah, I see so all that sort of clap. Let me throw some confetti, some confetti up there for you. Excitement. <laughs> throw some confetti for you, Nick. Thank you. So I appreciate thank it. Thank you so much for the opportunity. I always appreciate getting the message out. Thank you. And so now we're going to try to don't go off. We're going to try to suspend yeah. and come back. You're up. So don't I'll maybe go see off. you guys in five or ten seconds. All right, let's we'll see. I wonder if folks can hear me. Can hear you now. Excellent. So did you suspend? Did yep, you suspend? Yep, it basically okay. just muted everybody, turned off everybody's screen share, uh, but it did not give any kind of a notice. So give people no, a shout, it sounds like. No, oh, it, it did? Okay, great. It said all activities have been suspended. suspended. All right. And you, the so host it does seem like that would be confusing. Yeah, so it did say that. Okay, so we know that that works and we know that we can come back. Are you, Aman, are you, and Laura, are you raising your hands? Uh, let me ask you, uh, ask you guys to unmute. Oh, I'm not the host anymore. <laughs> oh, I still would like to thank, um, and, and if anyone is interested in, in looking at this presentation, you know, feel free to go to our, um, our Facebook page, uh, um, the um, African American Resource Center um, on Facebook. You can Google it and go on Facebook and put it in and you'll be able to see this very same presentation in case you have to go through second or minute or by second by second and parse it out because it's very um, informative with great information. So thank you so much. Again, well, tune into know, our page. Um, Laura and Aman yeah. have raised hands. So go ahead, guys. Uh, one thing I noticed is that it took away all of our like profile pictures. So you mm -hmm. can't like visually see anyone anymore. Um, yep. I, I thought that was very interesting. I see that. Yes, our, our profile pages, when we stop the videos are right. gone. Yep, and that's it. In case uh, one of the ways you might be being harassed is somebody changing their uh, profile or their video to being something obscene or, or upsetting. And so they just they because it's an avenue that somebody in the past has used for harassment, they, they knock that out along with everything else when they suspend. Isabel, I think Isabel has a question. Uh, Robert Jenkins has a question or their hands are just raised. Yeah, I, I, I had a comment. I wanted to say sure. thank you for uh, putting this together and uh, Nick for leading this. I really learned the whole if I, if I could put my video on. I still can't. Uh, but, um, <laughs> right. so, yeah, I just I just wanted to say thank y'all for um you know taking the time to to do this because I definitely learned a lot, especially about the audio watermarking. But um, yeah, I, I just wanted to make sure I I extended my gratitude and not just be like you know a disembodied box. So thank you so much. Thank you. Yeah. Thank um, you. I just thank you. I just well, wanted to say that when you came back, the chat was disabled again. <laughs> So, yes. so that's why we couldn't ask any questions. That checks out. Man, I'm trying to figure out how to re-enable it. Okay, so when we when you suspend and bring it back, the chat, right. there's uh, an ability to chat. I think this doesn't come, uh, yeah, Laura, automatically okay. right back on. Well, I was gonna say the same thing about the chat. I was just okay. wondering if maybe when you suspend and you come back, it goes back to the defaults that were set at the beginning where the chat was disabled when we've started the meeting? Probably. It, it doesn't seem to. Um, it looks like the, 
um, that the suspend function sets all the settings, but it doesn't have like a big switch to put them back. <laughs> um, so like it muted me, turned off my video and I didn't have a way to, I had to just go and mute and return it on. Um, and uh, yeah, I'm trying to figure, I, I have somehow lost the ability to turn the chat back on. I apologize. Oh, because I, you're not the um, host. I took the host for thing back, so. <laughs> Great, excellent. So yeah, if you want to turn the chat back on, it's, you know, feel free, but I think we're pretty well wrapped up. <laughs> you tell me how to turn it back on. I'll be happy. <laughs> well, make him. How about make him make him the host again? I do it. I do and, and, and Nick, if you can, can you do that ten second one more time and be able to try it? Yeah. So, um, uh, basically, the to turn it back on, just to get everyone on the same page, it's that security button down at the mid, at the bottom when you're a host and you know it's near uh, mute, and then you know you have to recheck the box for allow chat. So when you suspend it, you can come back, and when you as the host bring it back, the chat will come back as well. If you hit allow chat. Oh, if you hit allow chat, yeah, thank yeah, you sorry. for clarification. Yeah, so I just had to, you have to turn it back on manually with that uh, uh, that security button, you know, which has the options for allow participants to, you know, screen share, rename themselves. Um, like for instance, right now, um, start video isn't turned on. Um, so most participants can't restart their video, but I could re-enable that from, from there. Oh, wow, that's awesome. I see that Laura Sprague has a question. She has her hand raised. Laura, you she asked. Oh, she asked the question. Okay, thank you. I was I wasn't sure. Um, and so I was okay. able to, yeah, but not able to chat or turn on the video. So it is four o five. Yes, it is. I'm trying to be uh, very conscious of time because we know that we get on these Zoom meetings <laughs> and we don't want to suffer from too much Zoom fatigue. And I have two more today. So again, I want to thank you. And um, Nick, if people um, need to reach the information security yeah. office. So I'm going to just put my email in here. And, you know, uh, that should end up in the chat. Let's hope, hope I successfully chat well. And uh, really just drop me a line. I'm always glad to chat with you. I really enjoyed this okay. chat. This was really good. I mean, for you to come down from your, from your office to be able to work with us directly, I mean, it makes people feel good about the services and the work that you guys do. Thank you so much. Excellent. I really appreciate the opportunity. It makes me feel good, too. So thank you. All right. Have a good day, everyone. Thank Have you for good joining one. us. Take care. Take care. Thank you, everyone. Take care, Nick. Bye-bye. <laughs>